Chris, thanks for joining us here. Uh, we are in the North End in an abandoned housing complex by my house. Uh, this is a way that we're trying to do this over the summer is that we're trying to actually pull together small worship gatherings of less than 10, uh, including all the people that are playing roles in the Sunday service. So I'm preaching this week. In the following couple of weeks, we've got a bunch of different great guest preachers from in our community, including Cindy, who's singing this week. Um, so yeah, we will be filming these on Thursday. Uh, pardon? Brian's right, who's also preaching. This is the, here's the other rule. We're not allowed to cut, so this is all happening. Um, if you would like to be involved in these, we're gonna move them around the city, so we'll be posting in the Facebook group where the location is. We've got room for about four people most weeks to jump in. Um, and then we're hoping that this will feel more natural for us all as we watch this on Sunday, that we'll be watching our community participate in worship, and you'll kind of be taking the spot of the camera. Today, your eyes are John Butler, who's uh, hiding there behind. See if this will work. <laughs> Did that work? Oh. Ooh. Ooh. So John is filming this week. There we go. Uh, ooh. We've nice. got five videographers from in our congregation <laughs> who are going to be filming each week. And so you'll get different perspectives, uh, different eyes on worship times. And uh, if you're in a backyard gathering with others in the church, we'll try to give a concrete kind of next step question at the end of the service for you to discuss. Um, and also when we break communion together, please feel free to break communion safely in your group together. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me, Kevin at EucharistChurch.ca, or Jill, Jill at EucharistChurch.ca, and we'll be happy to kind of uh, help you along the way. And we'll just figure this out as we go through the summer, through ordinary time. Um, and we allow ourselves to kind of settle into the season and to continue to gather across the city in worship. So we'll take a moment of silence and then we'll begin. Oh, last thing. We don't have uh, the words to any songs or anything going on the screen because this is going to be one takes all of these weeks. So the songs today, if you want to Google them right now to pull up for at home, we'll try to post them online in advance, are Just a Closer Walk With Thee and The Weight of the World by, who's that song by? Rain for Roots is the name of that band, uh, The Weight of the World. So we'll post those early, but in case you missed it, you can Google those if you want to sing along. Okay, we'll take a moment of silence and jump in. strong Jesus keep me from all wrong I'll be satisfied as long as I walk let me walk close to thee just a closer walk with thee granted Jesus this my plea daily walking close to thee let it be dear Lord let it be through this world of toil and snares if I falter Lord who cares who with me my burden shares number thee dear Lord number thee just a closer walk with thee granted Jesus this my plea daily walking close to thee let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is o'er, time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely, oh, 
to thy kingdom shore, Lord, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. So let's take a minute to just prepare our hearts to be in this place. Um, as we do when we gather together to recognize that, that you have come to this moment out of a day that is very different than this next few minutes will be and you have things ahead of you that weigh in your mind and so I ask you to just take a second um, and turn your heart and your mind to this place uh, invite the Holy Spirit to come alongside you and speak to you and prepare you for what she has to say to you here We're going to call ourselves to worship um, from a quote that Dietrich Bonhoeffer used in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. It says, <clears throat> costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a person must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it will cost you your life. And it is grace because it will give you the only true life. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but deliver him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Grace is costly because it compels us to submit to the yoke of Christ and follow him. It is grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So over the summer, we're going to be following the rhythm of the church lectionary, which we've done as a congregation for a number of, uh, number of years. But anyone who doesn't know what that is, uh, the lectionary is a collection of scripture readings daily and weekly that Christians around the world and for a very, very long time uh, have been participating in together. And so before we get to this week's text, I want to set the mood by reading a quote from an author who I love, uh, D.L. Mayfield. I know you're a fan as well. It's a good quote. <laughs> She was writing, uh, she writes about racism, she writes about refugees, um, displacement, injustice. Her most recent book is called The Myth of the American Dream. And she talks about being on a writing retreat with this like beautiful, confident woman. And the woman told her, um, I feel like I might have a word from God for you. And she was like, okay, like open-handed, here we go. Like, I, I wanna receive this God, so share with me, you know, your word from God. And this is now a quote from her book, The Myth of the American Dream. She wrote, uh, what if, the woman said to me, as solemn as a prophet, what if you woke up one morning and were happy? <laughs> she let that sentence hang in the air for a moment, letting me understand the full impact. How would that change your life? How would that change your writing? What would happen to you if you woke up one morning and poof, if you were no longer angry at the world. Then she says, this woman told me she wanted to have a prayer time for me before the week was out. And I nodded my head again, but every time I saw her, I managed to slip out of her path unnoticed. 
I did not want her beautiful hand pressing on my shoulder. I did not want her praying to God to bless me with happiness. Instead, more than anything, I wanted her, this talent, talented, driven, complicated woman, to wake up sad herself. And the chapter goes on, I'm not going to spoil the whole chapter, to nuance that sadness, but I think that feeling of Christians are supposed to be happy, and Christians are supposed to be nice, and Christians are supposed to be pleasant, you know, that's such, um, for many of us, an ingrained feeling, that our faith is ultimately this very nice, polite thing, and we should be happy Christians and happy churches, but when the world is on fire and there's crisis all around us, sometimes we don't know what to do in the face of that happiness, and sometimes I think there's a question of whether Jesus would actually want us to be happy as a default. And that ties into this week's text from the lectionary. Now, this week, the lectionary did something very sneaky. We're in Matthew chapter 11, if you guys want to open it up or if people want to open it up at home. Um, But the lectionary does this thing where they'll take a chunk and then they'll skip a chunk and then they'll go to another chunk. And it's very confusing because books are written to be read like as a whole. Um, So I'm actually going to read a little bit beyond the lectionary piece. I will kind of skim apart. But I think to understand why what Jesus is saying here is so radical, we do need to slow down. So if you want to open up in your Bibles, it's Matthew chapter 11, verse 7. Context here, John the Baptist was a prophet who led the way before Jesus. He said, I'm not the coming Messiah, the one the Jewish people had been waiting for to free them and liberate them. But he said, I'm the prophet who's guiding the way. And so he was baptizing people. They were repenting, changing their mind, changing their direction to go with God in this new direction of peace and justice and mercy to prepare themselves for God's coming in the Messiah. And Jesus shows up on the scene and he's baptized by John. And now they have this ongoing relationship. But a few years into Jesus's ministry, John and his disciples are beginning to wonder, is Jesus the Messiah that we've been waiting for? Because he came along and we thought it's the Messiah and something big's going to happen. But nothing big has happened. Uh, he's walking around teaching. There are miracles, but there's no revolution yet. So the disciples of John, his followers, go to Jesus and say, are you the Messiah that we've been waiting for? Or should we be looking for someone else? And Jesus says, look, you tell them what you've seen. We're healing the dead. We're healing the sick. We're casting out demons. There's this amazing stuff happening. Don't lose faith sends the disciples back to John, the disciples of John back to John. And as they went away, this is verse seven, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. Now I'm going to read this right through kind of dramatically because I think you need to give it that dramatic edge. So I'm going to read it kind of, Aaron's a theater guy. This is my best theater. It's going to be bad. Don't judge it. Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare the way before you. Jesus continues, Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John came. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. So I think as a bit of a like, you'd need ears to understand what he's saying there. Like he's Elijah who is to come. It's, it's very tied up in their understanding of what the Messiah would look like. Is this tied to the character of Elijah in the Old Testament? But what he says about reeds and palaces is a good place to start. In the countryside, the wilderness, they would have had reeds. I didn't know this till I looked it up. It was lots of reeds and that's where the palaces were. It'd be like saying in our Hamilton context, like, what did you go out into the countryside of Ancaster to look for? Farming hills and McMansions made of stucco? No. What else was there there? A prophet. On the edge, there are the wealthy, there's the wilderness, but there was this prophet. 
And Jesus is saying, you responded to the message of the prophet. You were passionate. You listened. You went out to find him. You listened to his words. You were so lit up. And then he has this line about violence. Now, this is, I think, really a very cool line worth, worth teasing out a bit. What does that mean? I'll read it again from this translation. This is the NRSV. From the days of John the Baptist until now, Jesus is speaking, so a couple of years, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. Now, the word violent has a very negative connotation for us, um, but maybe violence isn't the right word to translate this with. There's a lot of debate. Um, Richard Beck is a theologian and psychologist who I have read a fair amount of on this text. And he um, pointed me to the actual word, which is biazo. That's the Greek word. And it's only used twice in the New Testament. Both times it's used in a positive sense. Um, so violence, and your footnotes will say this as well if you've got footnotes in your Bible. Violence isn't maybe the right word to translate it because violence is so negative in our mind. Um, maybe a better way to translate it is forceful, aggressive, grasped. So he puts forward a translation that you could have from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully coming and the forceful sees it. They seize it. It's been forcefully coming and the forceful sees it by force could even be the way that you translate it. It's the idea that God's message through John the Baptist until now with Jesus was something people fought for. They grabbed onto it. They pushed themselves into it. There was no passivity. There was no sitting back and watching from a distance. They went to the wilderness. They were baptized. They were all in. They gave their energy to it. And it was not neutral. There was an aggression, uh, a, a forceful, almost you could use the word violence, except nonviolent in action, nonviolent to people, but a kind of aggression that was needed to enter into God's kingdom and to seize it. And now we know that that's a good translation of this or a better translation because of what Jesus is going to say from here. Right after that, Jesus says, but, that's how it used to be, forceful, but, what will I compare this generation? But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. Children's games that they would have played. You know, we play a little song and people are supposed to dance. We sing a little dirge and you're supposed to cry. So he's saying, you used to grab it forcefully and now you're playing games. He goes on after that to say, John came neither eating nor drinking. He was like fasting, kind of wild wilderness man. And they said, he has a demon. The son of man, Jesus' favorite title for himself. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. So you can see in this to set up his, his teaching here, Jesus is saying, you used to be so forceful. You're God's people. You're the Israelites. You know about prophets. You know about God's movement. You used to have all this forceful, aggressive energy to go and do what God was calling you to do. And now you're sitting around playing games. You're playing and saying, dance for us, prophets. Weep for us, prophets. Oh, John, you're sitting back and saying, John, oh, he's got a demon. Or you see Jesus eating and drinking with the wrong people. You go, oh, he's a glutton and a, and a friend of sinners and tax collectors. You used to have so much skin in the game and now you're so apathetic. It's an interesting challenge. I don't know about you guys, but when I think back on earlier in my faith, there was a time where I was really passionate <laughs> Like there was a time when I first had a big faith awakening. I know I'm still kind of passionate. I'm yelling right now, but you should have seen me at 17. I was nuts. No, I know I'm, I've got some of it back. There are seasons where you lose it and you get it back. But there was this time when I was like first faith awakening. Maybe you've got faith awakenings in your life you could point to. And you were like, God, whatever you want, I'm there. I want to follow you. I want to worship. I want to pray. I want to fight for justice. I want to fight for mercy. I want to participate in what you want. I remember being like 17, 18, 19 and being like, whatever you want, I'll just do it. I only want to do this radical. I don't want to do this unless I'm sold out for God and his kingdom. And then I got a job <laughs> in the church. Oops. <laughs> and I got a mortgage and I got bills to pay. Some of us get married. Some of us have children. 
And then we start getting tired because you get in, it's been a really long day and there's so much entertainment. So you start binging a little bit more. Maybe you get enough money to go out for dinner a little bit more or go out for drinks a little bit more often. And slowly over time, that passion kind of levels out. You find some new comforts. And before long, church is not the most exciting thing. The good news of Jesus and the gospel is, yeah, that's nice, but is it really what I'm sold out for? There, there's some necessary wisdom in this, I'm going to say. You can't burn out forever. Like, you can't run full tilt forever. Um, something about taking on personal responsibility is good because it kind of levels your energy. But there's a real fine line between balancing out your life as a radical disciple and just becoming another consumeristic entertainment driven Canadian polite person and I think there's a real critique here that there's a an apathy that sets in I mean even the idea I think Jesus would just find it wild that we say oh yeah I'm a Christian because I believe these things I almost feel like Jesus would be like what do you mean you what do you mean you think things like you think I came here just to help you think some things no or like, you know, that we'd say like, oh yeah, I go to church sometimes when I feel like it, when I'm free. He'd be like, you go to church. That, you think, I feel like Jesus would be like, you think I did all this so that sometimes when you feel like it, you'd go to church? You know, we be, that we become cold and hardened and dead. And th this feeling of like, how did we go from forcefully seizing the kingdom to passively sitting back? How did we go from a movement to a hobby that for so many of us, myself at Seasons included, our faith is less of a radical movement and more of a hobby that we do for fun. Are we invested in the world so much as it is that we can hardly dream of a new world? That the new world Jesus was ushering in might even become bad news because we're so invested in the status quo. The church has been so guilty of this throughout her history, sitting back, crossing arms, going, I wanted better music. I played a dirge. Why aren't you crying? I wanted a different kind of sermon. I, I sang a song. Why aren't you dancing? Judging other followers of Jesus. Oh, he's got a demon. Oh, they're wild. Oh, they've lost the plot. Oh, he's a drunk. Oh, he's a glutton. Friends with the wrong people, the wrong associations. How often have we allowed the consumerism of our culture, the apathy of our culture to get into our Christian faith? And is Jesus here calling us back to a much more radical way of being? This text goes on. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole section, but Jesus says, if the signs, he's talking to his own people here. He's in Galilee, his own region, Israelite people. He says, if the signs that were done in you were done in Chorizon and Bethsaida, or sorry, if, if the signs done in you, speaking to uh, a town called Bethsaida, and Chorizon, Chorazin? Chorazin? Chorazin. It always sounded kind of like, what's that meat? Like chorizo. chorizo. I keep being like, in chorizo. I'm like, mm, delicious, Jesus. <laughs> Woe to you, chorizo. I'm like, I like it. <laughs> um, that's silly. That's silly. But he says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the deeds of power done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon, those are foreign towns, not God's people. If they were done in their towns, they would have repented long ago with sackcloth and ashes. They would have recommitted themselves to justice and mercy and God's ways. God's come to his own people in Jesus and his own people won't even hear the message. They're, they've lost the forcefulness. Side note, if you want to look it up later, Matthew 15, look up which towns he goes to, who he finds there, and, and ask yourself the question, is this character forceful or not? And you'll see a whole other commentary that this text is setting up that we don't have time for. But he says, you know, would you, would you have, would you not turn around and repent that the other nations, people that aren't God's people, would hear this message and respond, and yet you guys are not? Which I think, faithfully, we could say that if God's people aren't going to respond to God's nudging, God's movement, God's message, that God is willing to raise up other people to do the work with him. So the last couple of weeks, thinking about Black Lives Matter, thinking about indigenous justice and reconciliation, thinking about the world refugee crisis, 
thinking about the imprisoned on Barton Street who were doing hunger strikes to fight for basic human rights, thinking about gentrification. Neighborhoods like this neighborhood, once this was a thriving neighborhood just a few years ago, full of uh, new arrival families, dozens and dozens and dozens of families, kids, the noise of children playing all the time, which is now gonna be leveled out to build a large set of high-end condos. As these issues surface, if God's people don't respond with forcefulness, with passion, with hearts that are ablaze, I think it's biblical to say God would rise up other people to do this work. And I think it's fair to say that he has. That there are people who would not call themselves followers of Jesus who are in step with the spirit. Maybe not perfectly, maybe not fully, but in ways that the church has absolutely failed. And we then as the church have a question Will we come alongside those who God is using, who God is calling, and humbly with them, alongside them, participate in what the Spirit is doing? If the church, and now I mean kind of the large Canadian American, North American church, if the church had responded to these cries earlier, there would not even be a need for so much of the work that's being done because there would have been justice so much sooner. There wouldn't have been the, the sin, the violence that we've seen. But because the church has failed, God is using other people to surface his work. And we now have the question, will we respond or will we sit back and say, play the dirge, why aren't people dancing? And I don't like that, and I don't like that, and I don't like that. So here's my confession. I always try to start in these sermons by going first. I had some really excellent books about indigenous reconciliation and justice on the bookshelf. And I was like, oh, I'm going to read them. And I read the first chapter and I was like, that was a great first chapter. And then life got busy and full. And suddenly I went, you know what? This is so important. It's so important. I really need to save it for another time later. Because it's not like urgent for me in this body, in this city, with this privilege. It's not urgent. And now I'm seeing all this racial injustice conversations, conversations about black racism, anti-black racism in Canada, conversations about indigenous justice and reconciliation, and realizing that I lost my urgency. I had closed off part of God's nudging, calling to me to dig into these issues, to learn more, to build relationships where relationships had been emerging And I set it aside because I thought, oh, I'll I'll get to that later. And that apathy that Jesus is condemning here in the text, that apathy I completely gave myself over to. Um, Never hostility, like never like aggression against any other group, just a sense that I can get to that when I get to that. And reading Jesus here, these fiery words, for me has been a real call back to that urgency to consider this life and death, to consider this a burning issue, to become a person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, who hungers and thirsts for justice, enough to go back to Jesus and say, show me how to join you in this work. Or to repeat the line from Bonhoeffer that we had read, costly grace is the gospel, which must be sought again and again. The gift which must be asked for the door at which a man must knock. So my question to you all and to you all is have you continued to knock? Have you continued to ask? Have you continued to seek? To go back to Christ, to go back to the places the Spirit is moving again and again and again. And if so, be encouraged. And if not, then join me in yet another repentance yet another turning around, going back to the door, knocking and saying, I want to urgently pursue what you care about. Close off this section. Jesus says something that I think is a good counterpoint to this urgency and this fire. After talking about uh, this judgment on the cities where he was speaking, it says, at that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and you've revealed them to infants. 
Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So he talks here about, he's revealing this not to the elites, not to those in the mansions, but to those on the streets, to those at the ground level, to the unexpected, to the children, the infants. And then he closes up this radical section. Come on, let's go. Urgency, don't lose your fire. He closes this out by saying, come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If we're not carrying a burden, we don't need Jesus. I feel like it's so the opposite of urgency kind of being this apathy. When you're apathetic, what do you need Jesus for? You've got no burden. There's no weight of the world. There's no broken heart. It's only when we have something that we toil for, something that we long for, something that makes us sad when we wake up. It's only when we have something like that in our lives that we need to go back to Jesus, that we need to give the burden over to him, that we need to move at his speed and move at his pace and join him side by side. So my question to anyone watching this at home and to our circle maybe after we're done here, do you currently feel like there is a burden on you that you're carrying? that you have to join Jesus to carry well? Do you feel like there is that forceful, passionate burden? Or do you feel apathetic? And whichever way you feel, can you go back to the Christ who is calling you to join him in this work of justice and peacemaking and righteousness? So in a moment here, Brian's gonna lead us in a prayer exercise uh, maybe carry on to some of those ideas as we enter into this time. We are going <clears> to <throat> spend some time in prayer and we're going to do it around some of the themes that show up in that text. Some in the ways that Kevin's talked about it and maybe some others that as you read through that Matthew 11 passage you may hear as Jesus walked through this, this story there, there were expectations placed on him there was this burden of the, the need to receive the gospel. There was the call for wisdom. So all those things, we're going to use those to kind of shape our prayer time. I'm going to give you some moments to reflect on what that might be looking like in your life as well. Um, and we'll have sort of three places where I'll do our normal liturgy of saying, Lord, in your mercy, and you can respond with hear our prayer. So let's take a moment or two to focus ourselves to be present with God and see what he wants to say to us and what we need to say to him in prayer. Lord God, when you came to be among us in Jesus, he faced all the same issues that we do. He faced all the pain and all the glory that we humans experience. And so it's not hard for us to work to, to figure out that he fully understands what we face. And so God, since through Jesus, you completely get what we go through. We have confidence to be with you in prayer and to tell you what's on our minds. And especially some of the things that this passage has brought to mind. Um, we bring to you, God, the expectations that we wear. John couldn't please them. Jesus couldn't please the people around. There were all these things that needed to be done. God, we wear those expectations too. Some of them come from other people in our lives. Some of them come from ourselves. So, God, we want to take a few moments just to let you bring to mind the kind of expectations that are ringing in our heads right now. Bring those to mind, God. as those expectations that you're wearing come to mind, 
imagine yourself holding those up before God. Are those expectations in your life long-time visitors, or are they new acquaintances? Steph from our community shares this prayer. It's about some of the expectations she's facing. I'm feeling very overwhelmed with the contrast between medical protocols that I'm being told and my job in the healthcare and the way my friends, family, and general public seem to respond to taking precautions against the virus. I'm terrified about the consequences of these unknown toxins that I have to use daily to disinfect my workplace and the scary tasks of advocating for myself to be protected. I know I'm lucky to have work right now, but exposing myself to dozens of people in a small space during this pandemic was never part of my job description. It's so hard to watch some people be dismissive about the recommended precautionary measures when it feels like feels my whole exhausting job right now is to protect people. I'm angry and I'm so tired and I'm so tired of being angry. Please help me forgive those who seem to care so little about protecting my safety and help me not to resent or stay bitter while I work to protect theirs. God, all of us are carrying different kinds of expectations. So we know that even Jesus and John couldn't please everyone. So give us the strength of identity to be able to sort and evaluate and to carry these things with you well, Lord. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we bring you the burdens that we are bearing. Some of those burdens are about the brokenness in our lives, our own personal lives. Some of it is about the brokenness of the world we see around us, specific people and then systems and uh, attitudes and whole society-wide kinds of things. And sometimes those burdens are about losses and failures and the needs that never seem to be met. So God, in this moment of some reflection, we want to think about those burdens that we're carrying, and maybe it is a personal one, or maybe it is some of the systemic issues that are stirring in your heart and you're take, wanting to take on, or maybe it's about relationships, or just whatever those are. Bring those, bring those burdens to mind. And then for a moment, mentally just set them down before Jesus. And then see him lifting them with you. From our community, Kelly asks us to pray for the families of the farm workers who died due to COVID-19 in Ontario so far from home and for their deaths to change minds and hearts of us consumers, voters, and leaders. And a burden that Emily expresses, I'm asking for prayers for Macy and Stacy this week. Tuesday, Macy is getting bowel surgery, so please pray that she feels God's strength to get her through this and that she has a smooth recovery. And Wednesday, Stacy is getting ear surgery for her hearing, which she's been struggling with for quite a while. Please pray that all goes as expected and that we're grateful to have help from family during this time. God, we all carry burdens. And Jesus said, if we're burdened, if we're tired, we should come to him. So Jesus, we do. Stretch out our tired backs and bent shoulders and give us rest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Jesus also said that God, our parents, about giving us wisdom right where we need it. And so, God, there are a lot of questions where we need your wisdom. And some of those are about the very burdens we've just been thinking about and, and, and seeking to have you help us carry. So, God, speak to us with your wisdom. Yes, in this moment. But every day as we're walking, as we're watching news feeds, as we're listening to friends.
God, if we've heard from you, give us the will to follow you. And if we haven't, give us the patience to wait and to listen. And God, if we couldn't even at this moment in our life muster up a good question to ask you, answer with what you know we need to hear. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So God, help us to walk this week a little clearer in our identity, a little lighter in our step, a little deeper in your wisdom to face our days. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Uh, we celebrate communion weekly together because as you've already heard a couple of times today costly grace is the gospel that must be sought again and again and again the gift gift that must be asked for the door at which we must knock on the night that he was betrayed jesus took bread and he held it out to his disciples and he said, this is my body which is given for you. And after the meal, in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. This is my blood which is shed for you. Whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you will remember me until I come again. And we do this repeatedly as a way to remember um, the Christ Jesus who died for us and remember that we believe um, that he is coming again. But today I particularly want us to remember that we have to ask, that we need to want this. And so as you come to the bread and wine today, I want you to ask yourself, do I want this? Is this something that I want? Am I prepared to bear the cost of what that is. And if you want it, I invite you to take the bread and the wine and taste them together.
body is weak I haven't got any good words to speak My heart often falters My footing's unsure Under the weight of the world The weight of the world The weight of the world Under the weight of the world to bear just one is able just one anyway I'll take it all to King Jesus in prayer he's strong in prayer he's strong for the weight of the world the weight of the world the weight of the world he's strong for the weight of the world the weight of the world the weight of the world he's strong for the weight of Faith is too strong to tear Woven by Christ the saints daily will wear The surety that Jesus, so strong and so fair Has carried the weight of the world The weight of the world, the weight of stand together as we go with the benediction. Typically when we do benedictions, I say take a posture of reception and lots of people in our congregation will extend and open their hands, which is a beautiful way to let God take things and put new things in. But in light of um, being people who forcibly seize the kingdom, who grab Christ, who refuse to let go, I want to invite you this week to actually clench your hands, to grasp onto the kingdom there's a fight or flight impulse here when it comes to the world. There's flight. I don't want to see the trial of the world, the weight of the world. There's fight. It's on me to fight this myself. But there's a third way, as always, Jesus gives us, which is that he has overcome the world. He has taken the weight of the world on himself and overcome it in his resurrection. And as we cling to him, we're taken where we need to go. John 17 Speaking to the disciples, Jesus said, The hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have said this to you, so that in me you may have peace. 
In the world, you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. Christ has conquered every enemy, has conquered the world. So beloved of Christ, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Depart in peace and in great joy. Amen. Amen. Church. church. We did church. Thank you.